Hello, good evening and welcome. I'm Karima Brown and you're watching Political Exchange, where we unpack Africa's political economy. Geopolitical developments have once again demonstrated the need for South Africa to improve its energy security and supply. And while the government has always been committed to diversified energy mix and recognizes that all its resources should be exploited as responsibly as possible, it has come in for heavy criticism on some of the choices it makes. Well, to unpack these issues with me is South Africa's Energy Minister, Dipua Peters. Minister, thank you so much for your time. In your budget speech in February, you were saying that you announced the development of what you call an integrated energy plan that is going to be tabled. How far are we with this integrated plan that you mean to be de um, you know, giving to Cabinet quite soon? We have had an opportunity, and thank you, Karima, for having me here. We've had an opportunity as the department to present to Cabinet and... Remember that uh, when you go to cabinet, it is not just to go and inform them. It is to allow for the divergent inputs because other sectors like uh, minerals, science and technology, environment and others needs, in particular agriculture also, needs to make their inputs. So we took it to cabinet and cabinet um, decided to say there are certain assumptions and parameters that we needed to go and expand on. But also remember on the 31st of March, we had the colloquium yes. where we had different stakeholders who also made their inputs. So we also wanted to allow for those particular type of exchanges. The academics also made their inputs, the sectors also made their inputs. And remember, this is an integrated energy plan. So it took, it, it speaks to electricity, but also to liquid fuels, as well as other energy sources that we need to speak to. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, the key is diversification. We all know the dangers of relying on one source of energy in a globe that is constantly seeking out energy. To what extent is this integrated plan um, approaching energy as a holistic uh, issue, integrating the various issues that, that need to be integrated to make it sustainable in the long run. I just want to go a little bit back that uh, one of the key assumptions that we thought needed to be elaborated on is the potential for gas in the region, but also the potential for doing additional, more sort of research on our own resource potential because at that time already you would remember when we had the colloquium the minister of mineral resources had declared a moratorium on shale gas but also remember that there is positive indicators for the potential for coal bed methane in the Limpopo province uh, coexisting with the water bed uh, coal resources. So for us as a country the integrated energy plan needs to speak to everything that we have, everything that the, our uh, uh, neighbors have, but everything that the continent have, and also assume our demand or our consumption patterns. So that is why we said that let us look at everything. It doesn't help us to rush into a decision about an integrated energy plan whilst we don't have the total uh, a picture of what we have available. So I would say that the, the, the decision to, to do a moratorium has helped us because we have now factored some of those uh, things that come from DMR. So a more rational approach, you would, would, would say. Minister, of course, the big um, question is the use of um, and the policy position on nuclear energy. Now, we know different countries do different things. In Germany, we, we know that they've announced a phase out of their nuclear program, whilst the French were saying they're considering it. Bring us up to speed, Minister. To what extent is nuclear power um, a central pillar of this integrated plan? And is it something that we are going to rely on considering what happened in places like Fukushima in Japan? I just want to say that we need to explain that nuclear, we did not arrive at it purely because we are in love with nuclear. We arrived at it because of the fact that we had to factor in our own South African long-term mitigation scenarios against climate change. We then said if we have to make sure that we have security of supply and we have reliable, affordable electricity supply and make sure that we address the needs of the economy, but plus also of society, more than almost 30% of South Africans don't have access. We then had to factor in all the resources and uh, 
energy carriers that we know as South Africa have been proven, have been commercialized, and that we do know as South Africa we've got the capacity on. Already we are running Uber for more than 25 years. So we considered all those factors. And we also considered the fact that South Africans want reliable supply. South Africa has got now a beneficiation strategy. If we have to beneficiate our commodities, we need uh, uh, reliable, reliable supply. Our economy is predominantly mining driven. For us to be able to make sure that we extract the, 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 the minerals that we have out of the mother earth, we need power supply. And I think it is important that people understand the premise from which we move. We are saying, Remember that at Copenhagen, President Zuma on the 6th of December 2009, part of the leaders platform said that we are going to grow our emissions, plateau and decline. And we also factored that in. But also remember that uh, as South Africa, we, we really need to make sure that our trajectory going into the future is low carbon. And we looked at all those factors. Anything that comes to the fore, like for example, the new technologies with solar and wind, if we can be able to have partners that can address the cost issue, we are going to be able to, to actually move faster towards it. I was happy on the way here, I read about the PV um, prices going down, and it says it's positive news for us. Out of our renewable energy IPP procurement, the first window, the cost of uh, the technology uh, as compared to the second window where it had gone up, uh, down, it shows that as we go down, and the uh, uh, record, uh, I mean, rec uh, uh, reports indicate that by 2017, coal would be able to compete with PV. So it will be good news for us. But up until we reach that stage, we don't have any alternative. And also remember that renewable energy doesn't have storage as we speak. And as South Africa, we are concerned about those that don't have access as we speak, but also the ability to make sure that we meet the triple challenges that the president spoke about. Unemployment, we need to create jobs and you need energy to create jobs. So we look at everything. And, and I think the, 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 the 52nd conference resolution of the African National Congress actually also said we need to use everything that is available within our means. And that is what we are considering. As we speak, we've got the nuclear uh, uh, energy structures, which is the uh, N -E -E C, which is meeting under the chairpersonship of the deputy president with all stakeholders combined. We're looking at everything that is related to even the concerns that are being raised by South Africans as related to issues of the potential safety consideration. Remember, South Africa is part of the International Atomic Energy Agency. We adhere to the protocols on uh, nuclear safeguards. And all those are very important. So I just want to say that anything that can come in, and we are praying, and, and I want to say to you that as a, a true believer, I always pray that God, can there be something between now and the time we have to take the final decision? We'll definitely take it like this. But Minister, you were speaking here importantly about partnerships, of course, particularly business is a partner, especially in terms of renewable energy. Talk to me about the opportunities that there are for private um, entrants into the energy sector um, and, and, and how government sees this process happening. We have a policy that uh, says that uh, more than 30% of our power, new power, at least 30 to 35% must be IPP. We have developed the IPP regulations and promulgated them. We have already started with the renewable energy space. Mm -hmm. You would know that uh, we have now, for base load purposes, sent out requests for information, which creates that platform for independent power producers also to participate at that level. But remember that that power that is generated by independent power producers needs to be factored into the grid which means it must be bought by ESCOM, and ESCOM must sell it to ordinary South Africans. And ordinary South Africans must be able to afford that power. The economy or industries must be able to afford that power. It should not be an overhead that is too exorbitant. So the, the price that ESCOM or the commercial arrangements between ESCOM and the private entities, the IPPs, the commercial arrangements, 
are very important so as to be able to consider the call by the president also to say, let us make it possible that the cost of energy does not drive away investment, does create an environment for job creation and uh, poverty but, elevation. But how do you balance, Minister, making energy profitable for companies, because that's what they're interested in, but also affordable for a South African population that is plagued by unemployment, by inequality, and by joblessness? That is a very, very, very uh, as, um, critical balancing act. Because truly speaking, like you say, the investors want return on investment. And we are saying we want uh, energy. And I just want to say, it was very interesting that in China, the Chinese were saying, South Africans are funny. You want electricity, but you don't want to pay for it. And I said, I would be happy that you can come and help us to engage with the South African community. But the reality is that South Africans, we have agreed that we need to go into a massive campaign. And it is something that we are taking to NetLab. It has already started to say, how do we, in the spirit of Proudly South Africa, deal with the issue of the cost of power generation, the cost of bringing even the liquid fuel to the pump where you fill up your car or your truck so that people can understand what goes into it, what are the total value chain resources that are necessary for investment, but also for the country because the South African uh, 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 government, through the incentives we need to put in place to be able to make sure that we attract investors. So I believe that it is a very critical balancing act that we play, but we, we believe that with engagement, we are able to meet it. That is why we're saying the best first line of available energy is actually energy efficiency. And that is why through even fuel efficiency, but also energy efficiency from the electricity side, we are saying that when you save, you actually prolong and sustain the little resource that you have. And you will be able to save your little uh, uh, runs and cents. And that is why we believe that it is in partnership with South Africans that we can be able to achieve that. Now, obviously, bringing in um, independent power producers into this market is a very heavily contested one. You have many bidding processes happening. Um, we know that people are already um, you know, trying to get in on the game. We know with our arms deal, there was a massive outcry about um, potential corruption, um, the results of which plagues our society still today. Minister, as an energy minister, how confident are you that bringing private players in on such a large tendering process is going to be transparent, is going to be within the law, and is not going to be about connecting politically connected individuals with the right um, you know, uh, 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 um, uh, tenders? How are you going to make sure that this process is above board? We have already started with the Renewable Energy IPP procurement, where we have even been told by other partners in the world that this is the most credible process that we have uh, actually gone through. And I would believe that even the second window, same process went through. And with now, if we call for the request for proposals regarding the base load, it would also be equally the same. I believe that it is important that our processes be credible so that no one should come back and say, we need to take this matter to court because that court process will then end up creating energy insecurity. And that is why our process from the energy sector, we believe, needs to be credible. And also remember that bringing in IPPs, it's actually allowing independent power producers to produce or generate power and sell it to the grid. So they would also be running their own procurement processes. And ESCOM would also, through the, the uti uh, utility processes, be running their own processes. So I would believe that we have learned lessons and we are structuring. And you have heard what we have done with the Minister of, of, of Finance. That is why you would find that the relationship with the electricity pricing in particular between energy, treasury, as well as DPE is very important. And those processes have been strengthened. And I would believe that even going forward, we need to tighten them even up further. Because like I said earlier on, the Electricity Act regulations actually demands that when the minister has determined, then ESCOM must buy. And ESCOM must buy at a cost that will be affordable to the economy and to society broadly. So I think that anybody with a sound mind would understand that if you bring in corrupt uh, activities and make the process so uh, uncredible, you are actually going to hit the pocket of individual South Africans. And I think it is important that we really 
been a, a create that environment. And I, I would want to say we have created it. Our process so far has been clean. And the second one also, and I always say to the DG that we want a credible process. And I'm so happy that even the bidders, when they came back, they said we lost out, but we know how we lost out. We don't feel cheated by a process. There's not been a court case, and we also believe that we need to tighten up the relationship. That's why you saw how we work together with environmental affairs, how we work together with uh, water to make sure that the water licensing issue, how we're working together now with mineral resources about the coal uh, pricing, but also the coal mining uh, uh, arrangements. But also going forward, if anything, with regard to science and technology, also working with us with the new technologies that we bring in to make sure that we can reduce the cost of energy production, energy distribution and, and, trans and transformation and consumption in the country. I believe that really corruption would be actually responsible for keeping the lights off if we allow space for it. And I don't think that we've got any more space for corruption in the, any process in the energy sector. Minister, we have to take a short break, but when we come back, we will continue our conversation with South Africa's Energy Minister, Dipua Peters. <music> Welcome back. You're watching Political Exchange. I'm Karima Brown. I'm discussing with South Africa's Energy Minister, Dipur Peters, how we're going to secure our energy supplies going into the future. Minister, you spoke also about the need to do an audit on our refineries um, to look specifically at the capacity. In fact, you said a preliminary investigation indicates that our refineries are experiencing reduced production levels, which is equally a threat to liquid fuel security of supply. Uh, what did the audit find? The audit, you remember, is done company to company, and uh, we're uh, engaging with those companies to look at how to we can address the areas that are a bit of a concern. What we also believe we need to do is that we need to factor in the outcomes of the audit into the clean fuels requirements, and thereby be able to address the areas where government needs to be able to augment or, or either a given incentive to the industry. So it's still work in progress because you'd remember that you have to go into each refinery. But we also, out of the liquid fuels charter audit, we had to increase the terms of reference for mm -hmm. the refinery audit because it is important that those results of over 10 years can be factored into this audit so that we don't come back after two years and say the charter said this and yet the charter was released, I mean the uh, audit of the charter was released whilst the, the audit of the refineries was ongoing. Mm -hmm. The other thing that was a bit of a challenge was that you'd remember that at times you'd fear that there are certain parts of the country that doesn't have liquid fuels. Of our neighbors, like one time on Christmas Day, we were called by the ambassador in Botswana that Botswana doesn't have have liquid fuels and they have to rely on South, South Africa yes and and when we checked on the challenges you'd find that Transnet says our loading trucks have been standing at the refinery for so many days they couldn't load because the loading bridges are, are, are broken so it is not only the refinery in relation to refining the 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 the, the, the oil mm or the, the pro and producing the product, but also the infrastructure. And that is why we are very excited as the energy department that we have been considered as part of the Presidential Infrastructure Commission and that the energy infrastructure is central to the PICC across all the SIPs, including the fact that we've got even three uh, strategic integrated uh, uh, projects just focusing on energy in itself. So. It speaks to how we make sure that going into the future, we take decisions that are informed at where the actual consumption of the, the products is and be able to make sure that we respond as such. We've got a big challenge in South Africa that we realize now with the, with the uh, uh, US and EU sanctions on Iran. In fact, let me come in there, Minister. Take us through that process because we, of course, were relying heavily on Iran, but we have geopolitical considerations to which we're not immune, as you've said before. Um, where exactly is that process? Because at some point it appeared as if different ministers were saying different things. You had the, def uh, the Deputy Foreign Affairs Minister saying one thing, you had you saying another 
another thing. Um, just take us through where we are in terms of the U.S. and EU sanctions against, against Iran and the fact that we get so much of our oil from Iran. Let me just give an indication now, as at present, what we're having is that we managed to get a, what you call an exception from the U.S., a 180 days exception that can show that we are really reducing our over-reliance on Iran, but also we have engaged, like I said earlier on in the year, with the owners of the refinery in particular, the engine refinery that is predominantly uh, uh, using the Iranian crude. But we also engaged with the Iranian government and uh, Ministry of Petroleum themselves to be able to engage and see how do we manage these particular uh, uh, challenges. As we speak, we, the only area that is a bit of a challenge now is the fact that the, the, re, the refineries are privately owned. And Petronas, which is the mother company of Engine, took a decision based on Malaysian uh, a geopolitical uh, a consideration to look at alternative. And the alternative obviously comes at a, a higher price from Saudi Arabia and other sources. But also we are looking at making sure that we strengthen the one area, which is the uh, single boy mooring. That pipeline that brings the product or the, 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 the crude from the vessel into the country, which is owned by private companies also in South Africa. We're also looking in terms of the infrastructure, how to build that so that in future we also don't build according to particular countries' uh, 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 specs. What we are doing now, including the fact that we are going to be building the refinery in Kuha, mm -hmm. we are saying that that refinery should not be a particular single country source, but a multi-product or multi-source type of refinery, which would allow us in situations like this to be able to diversify. Because countries all over the world, in any case, are diversifying. And it is important for us also to diversify. That is why, uh, 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 Karima, we're talking about the need for us to be allowed at least the space. And I, I hope that the minister of DMR would give us the report that gives us whether we can allow for space to explore for that uh, shale gas so that we can then be independent uh, to a certain extent. We can't be 100% dependent on external uh, sources. Our coal, which is the CTL initiative in, 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 in Sasol, is one of the challenges we have with greenhouse gas emissions. We're running out of gas for, 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 for Mosul Bay. So we need also to make sure that we've got alternative sources for our own uh, uh, indigenous technology in South Africa, the CTL and the GTL. So I, re I really believe that that uh, a shale gas initiative must be allowed the space to be explored. And I think you can help me pray. Well, let's talk about... Um energy in the context of SADC and of course Africa. We know that um, there's been reports of oil and gas off you know, uh, the, the Mozambican coast in Kenya and, and in other places. South Africa has, in terms of its new growth path, really located the economy uh, or economic growth within its regional context, understanding that mm -hmm. it cannot be a powerhouse in the sea of underperformance. Minister, just take us through the kinds of um, arrangements that we have, at least with our immediate neighbors, to secure more long long-term um, energy security and, and diversification of energy sources? We have uh, with both Namibia and uh, Mozambique what we call the gas commissions for both countries. And we have um, and we have been engaging with, you would know, in the electricity sector with uh, Zambia as well as with um, DRC. We have just now announced our... The INGA project. The INGA project, the treaty, and we will be engaging further with the DRC to make sure that we also establish almost along the same lines like the Lesotho Highlands Water Project, a commission to drive the project and drive the process. But also we have, as, as South Africa, we are part of the Southern African Power Pool. And whatever is available in the region is actually also geared for South Africa as a market. And uh, therefore, it is important that we strengthen the grid. That is why we're talking about the integrated grid. Because one of the things that we have realized is that it's integrated infrastructure for energy provision that would help us. Also, the, the you would know that we have been engaging only last week with Botswana. And Botswana is very big on CBM, also very big on, on coal, because they are on the same belt with Waterbeck, and we're looking forward to partnership. We signed an energy agreement last week. All these countries I'm talking about, we've got uh, MOUs and MOAs on, so as to be able to make sure that we can partner 
and be equals in the resources that we have available. Last year with the Ministers of Africa's uh, a meeting here in Johannesburg, we had an agreement that we need to map the key projects for the continent. We have mapped more than 15 projects that we believe we need to support for, for, for the continent so as to make it possible that we have a start to, to move into the continent. We also believe that if the five power pools in the continent can be uh, strengthened because the four is already operationalized, there's one outstanding, we can have an op a opportunity to interconnect even the power pools themselves, we can then uh, be able to power the continent. We're also looking at making sure that with Mozambique, you would remember the president paid a state visit to Mozambique in December, and there was an agreement between uh, uh, um, the Mozambican oil company as well as Petro SA on collaboration in the energy, s in the, uh, uh, energy space. Recently, ESCOM went to sign an agreement with the Mozambican company so as to power some of the gas, to create a gas-fired power plant in Mozambique that will feed into South Africa. But also, you know, Sasol draws its gas from Mozambique. So the, 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 the need for neighbor, uh, neighboring countries to collaborate and work together is paramount. But also what we agreed in, in September last year as the Ministers of Africa, who, which is chaired by the minister in Mozambique, we have agreed that we need to do a continental resource map, which would then speak to almost like we did with our own integrated resource map, a trajectory that says into the future, which plants are coming in the continent going to come in when. One of the key challenges we identified is project proposal funding and project development uh, funding. And we're looking at how we can be able to strengthen that because we believe that it is through sovereign funds that we need to really develop the project so that we can then be able to invite investors on something that has been enabled, something that has been facilitated. That is why you look at what we're doing with the solar park. We are busy now with a feasibility study, which would then speak to a common environmental impact, a common power purchase agreement, all those that would make the doing of business easier. One entry point and you don't have major challenges. But also all this that we do, we're looking at how we can be able to attract the different component manufacturers to South Africa and to the region and the continent so that we can then be able to create the jobs here. Minister, thank you so much. Much, much, much more to talk about. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. That's where we have to leave it for tonight. Tune in again tomorrow night for another edition of Political Exchange. I'm Karima Brown. Goodbye. Thank you.